Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Marta, and I'm a quality engineer at Red Hat. And I'm going to talk to you about something that we've uh, been developing. Um, actually, started developing along quite quite a number of years ago, but we're finally making some progress on. And it's, um, it's we call it Nimble, uh, which stands for No More Bootloader. <laughs> thank you, Art. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to first start with a little disclaimer that what we have been working on and developing so far is, um, is all UEFI based. We don't think it necessarily has to be that way, but everything that I show you today and that I talk about is going to be UEFI, but hopefully that's not the only, the only path. So what is Nimble? Um, Nimble is basically now, it's a unified, unified kernel image. So it's the kernel and the kernel command line and the init ramifas, and it's all bundled up. And now, as I said, for UEFI and FE stub, so we have an entry point so that we can actually execute this thing. Um, and uh, we have, since we have this FE executable, the whole thing can be signed. So it all works with secure boot. Uh, we're not getting rid of shim, as you can as you can see. It's just. So, so rather than having something, some other bootloader uh, load this UKI, you simply have shim load it, and, and that's it. Um, we like to think of, of Nimble more like as an idea, because uh, we're, we know that a lot of, we're, we're trying to basically use a lot of tools that already exist in Linux, and that um, maybe can be, are different in different distros, uh, but that can all come together and that can, that can make this idea work. So for us, uh, for Fedora, for example, um, you know, we're, we're going to be using some, some of things that, that are familiar in different distros, but um, we use the system D stub, for example. Um, we'd like to have a, a menu, uh, perhaps, in certain implementations, so we use the grub emu. Uh, we need some init ramifest genera generator. For us, it's Dracut but it is different in, in different distros. I mentioned secure boot already, and then of course we have the unif unified kernel image. And all of these together, which is already you know, code that is working, that is being tested, all together, um, we, we come together and we have, we have this, this idea that is, that is nimble. Um, we currently have sort of two schemes uh, that we're looking at. I hope that you can, you can see more or less what it says. So this, on the, on the left is the, what we call the switch root case, and basically going from UEFI, um, being verified through shim, and then, and then Nimble being built with the same kernel uh, that you then want to boot into, and so uh, basically you just, you just pivot and you're already in user space, you're already in the kernel that, you're, that you wanted to boot, the one that you're, the one that you're, in, you're interested in. Um, but potentially, you don't necessarily always want to do that. Uh, you might want to be able to choose the kernel that you, that you want to run. So we have another, what we call, k-exec case, uh, which you know, starts, starts the same way um, through shim, and then we use the grub emu, which gives us a familiar menu, so the user would see the same kind of menu that they're already used to that looks like grub. Um, you could then choose potentially a different kernel, and then you continue uh, as before, and you, you go into your final kernel and you're in user space. Um, so a question that I know many people have had is why, why are we doing this? What's, uh, what's the point? There are a lot of bootloaders out there, and um, why, why would we want to do this? So the first place is, is to replace Grub. And, um, don't get me wrong, Grub is great, not just because Daniel is uh, organizing this microconference and graciously, uh, graciously allowed me to speak, but I mean, Grub is, is really, I mean, it's been really good at what it does. Uh, many distros use it. It's still, you know, a very popular bootloader, and it does a lot of stuff. I mean, it knows uh, so many different file systems. It can boot from complex storage. It can boot... Um, you know, different, uh, there are so many, there's support for fonts, for network booting, for just, it does a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, it, um, so it's, it's very complicated. It's sort of like a mini operating system by itself. And as a result, 
um, there are a lot of bugs, as has been mentioned. There are a lot of bugs, there are a lot of security vulnerabilities, and a lot of these are in, yeah, in file systems, in, in these kind of, in storage. And those are, those are, they're hard to fix, and they're, they're, so, so we'd like to replace Grub, but retain Grub's functionality. We don't want to have a, a niche bootloader. I mean, there are plenty of niche bootloaders out there, and if you want to use one on your laptop, we're not stopping you, obviously. Um, but we'd really like to somehow replace the functionality that we have in Grub um, while, while not having to write lots of new code. Um, we'd also like to you know, be able to deliver features more quickly. Um, so if we use the kernel as its own bootloader, clearly there are a lot of people working on the kernel, a lot more than work on the bootloader. Um, there's a lot more sort of scrutiny into the kernel. And importantly, once you implement something once, it's already there. You don't have to re-implement it. You don't, have to, you don't have to do it again. You don't have to write new code. Um, so, so you get that feature. As soon as it's in the kernel, it's also in the bootloader. It doesn't, there's, not, there's none of the, the lag that exists now. Um, we would be getting rid of a lot of buggy code, so that would increase security. We'd also be you know, bundling the init ramifs in this signed image, which would increase security, and security scrutiny as well, as I mentioned. There are a lot of people, a lot more people work on the kernel, and it, it, has, a lot of, it has a lot more scrutiny. So that would, all of that would translate now into the bootloader also. We think it could decrease boot time as well, uh, especially if you're using the, uh, the switch root case. Um, so potentially that could be another, an, another benefit for using Nimble. <coughs> So now, one question that you might have is, what about the command line? Um, if we're bundling everything together into, into one signed image, then that means that you can't modify the command line anymore. And that can be a problem, of course. You might, this is something that you might want to do. So there is one in, I know that in system D, there are possibilities, uh, some extensions where certain command lines uh, are already signed, and you can you can you can implement those as well. But we have our own scheme that we're just we've just started sort of talking about and implementing, and we call it it's like a we call it the, the shim hive, and it's a stolen idea from Microsoft of the registry hive, <coughs> including the name stolen. And the idea is to um, to uh, have within an FE variable. To have the the uh, to have a, a rather than like a, a string, we could have a key value pair. So like a key value store, like a hive, which would um, keep values, uh, including one one would be one would be the command line. Um, it would look like this. Maybe this makes it a little bit easier to see. So you would have like a uh, an FE variable. Um, with, with a name and a path, and then the next, the next parts of it, you would have the path to the next bootloader, which could be, and which could be whatever that is, the nimble, and we could have the command line, and the command line could then be, could be, could be stored there. You could access it, you could change it in, in user space, and then it would be changed in the shim hive, and it would be in your FE variable. It would be interacting through FE boot manager, and you could still secure boot, um, and, and this way, there would be some, some uh, ability to change this command line. And then the next important question is, what about fallback? Um, potentially, you could be, um, when you update your, your kernel, you could be updating your bootloader as well. That's kind of the case that we think makes a lot of sense. Um, but if you're, if you're updating basically your entire sort of mechanism for, for booting and for your kernel, that might be kind of scary. Um, and you don't want, you might, you might want to make sure that there's something, um, uh, some, something good, some, some, something that you know that boots um, that's still available. So again, this is, this is a, an example from, from, EFI, from UEFI, but we think that this can also be implemented in some other manner. We basically need the ideas of like a boot current, a boot next, and a boot order. Um, so the last known good, whatever you're booted into now, um, 
and then you set boot next to your new whatever it is. You've updated your, your, your shim, for example. You've updated your kernel. So you set that to boot next, but you retain your boot order. And so as a result, if, you, um, if the boot succeeds and everything is fine and your new, your new entry uh, boots, then your boot order changes and this new uh, this new, this new uh, chain that you booted into will become the, the first in the boot order. And in case it fails, um, you simply fall back to, to the boot order. It'll, it'll fail and you, have, you still have the FE boot order. Maybe you have to reset, maybe you have to reboot, but it, um, it allows you to have a scheme that, that saves you in case something goes wrong. So, so that's it. Um, that's, I, I wanted to leave, leave some time for, for questions. I just wanted to, to mention everyone who's been working on this uh, over the years. Also, um, the people, uh, Peter, Peter Jones is of course very, very involved in this as well as other people um, past and present in the bootloader team. So thank you very much for your time. We are very, very interested in your ideas and your questions, um, feedback, um, so. Can you try Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? Peter. Here. Okay, sorry. Uh, can we get back to the slide with the, with the hive, with the shim hive? So how, would, how those variables will be protected? Like uh, if someone can like modify those, then uh, potentially can add parameters which can bypass security checks. So the question is if those, there is plan to have these um, variables in trusted computing base? I don't think we're that far along yet. I mean, definitely these are only things that can be, um, you would be, that the root user could be, could modify. Um, <coughs> if they would be stored somewhere else, I don't know. I don't think we're far enough along to, to answer that. Yeah, so, the, so the way in UFI is to make it uh, authenticated variables? And then in that way, there is like a, some control. You need a key to update that. Uh, but I don't know if this is plan. Like if you will have to go that way, then that's probably the solution. Mm -hmm. So thanks for your presentation. So uh, do you know how this uh, differs from older solutions like Kboot and Petit Boot? Um, I mean, uh, I'm not sure about kboot. I know that Petit Boot uses two different kernels. There's a stripped down kernel that begins the boot process and then it executes uh, a second full kernel. So our idea, of course, those ideas, some of that, the old solutions, as, as you mentioned, this is not like a new, this is not a completely new solution. Some things like this have, have, have existed before and exist, continue, continue to exist. Um, but our idea is really that it would be the same kernel and that potentially you would really use the same kernel for everything, both for the, for the bootloader itself and, and that, that there wouldn't be several versions. I'm not sure, I don't know, I don't know Okay, though, so, so you, you would that. upgrade both kernels at the same time, well, typically with, uh, Pity Boot was just a graphical variant of Kboot, so it, very similar. Oh, I see. But yeah, in, no, de in detail, you, you kept using the old kernel usually as the initial one. I never updated that until you had a security issue or something like that. I think that we, we sort of imagined that the default case would be that you would sort of update both at once and that you would be using the, um, the switch root case most of the time, but, but that's why we have the possibility to do something else because maybe somebody doesn't want to do that. Maybe they want to have uh, the, use the old, the old uh, bootloader version and for the new kernel or, or whatnot. Uh, so for the fallback case, do you write iffy variables on every boot? Because uh, at least in Bearbox and System D boot, we they stopped doing that because iffy if if variables are usually not set, not something you want to write on every boot. It's flash without whoever leveling in some cases. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we would continue. I don't think we would keep around all the old ones. We would just basically, the idea is to have, I think, to have an A-B scheme so that we would have two, basically two variables for the, for the good one and the bad one, but we wouldn't keep around all the, all the old, all the, 
Yes, you but mean? you would need to set boot current on every boot. And if that hits the same flash cell every time, you are going to wear out your flash on a lot of iffy implementations, I think. Okay, okay, good to know. A bit uh, addition to that. Um, lots of NVRAM is battery backed, and uh, so the battery may reset, which means you, your um, uh, RAM is, uh, NVRAM is cleared. Um, so you also need to make sure that the previous one or the safe one is uh, set as the default uh, boots, boot whatever, dot EFI. Uh, hello, my name is Liang Yin. I, uh, yeah, this is very good work. I actually also worked a similar solution for Firecrack with the device. So I'm thinking in this case, uh, does it support, with, for example, does it support uh, with a GPU there with a device and when you boot up, the device is also in a ready state? Have you? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, because uh, I, I, while working on that, it's so difficult. Uh, like, uh, if it's only CPU memory, it might be relatively easier, but when add a like, pass-through device or, or, or device there, you need, um, the, the device need to go, go through some uh, BOSS UEFI there to, to memory, the, the, the device memory table there. So I, I, yeah, I had some trouble there. I'm just curious, uh, for your project here, have you considered the, this uh, user case? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I can't, I can't answer that for you, but we can, I, can, I can definitely get back to you with, with that information yeah. if you're interested. So just a, a note, um, so one of the reasons on ARM64 why we prefer booting through the EFI, through booting through EFI is that there's a lot of things that we can do in the EFI stub when we're in an EFI environment prior to exit boot services that we cannot do our, when we've been booted via KEXEC. So in the KEXEC path here, when you're booting kernel, there's a lot of things that you can't actually do that you would be able to do booting through Grub today. Mm -hmm. So it would be very nice if we could avoid the KEXEC case as much as possible there, so that, that functionality is available. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, to add to a KEXEC case, uh, I was playing with that many years ago. So probably when the fix changed, but my experience is that uh, we have been using KEXEC for KDump in our call to uh, grab uh, core dumps and uh, to do analysis. But uh, on the, as far as I can tell, I was uh, watching your earlier presentation at, I don't remember where, you were saying that you are doing experiments on virtual machines which are much, much more simpler than servers. Uh, in our case, when we are using KEXEC with many different cards and, uh, and uh, devices, uh, very often we had problems that uh, KEXEC was not able to, uh, to start second kernel due to problems with initializing uh, or reinitializing the devices. So did you start testing this on real hardware or do you still run tests on VMs or something like that? Um, We've started, to, I've started testing on real hardware. I haven't gotten very far with it. I, um, before we were also only testing x86, so I've built this also on Arch, and I'm testing both, I'm, I've started testing both, both x86 and, and Arch hardware. Uh, so far, so good, but I haven't, I haven't, I, I, I've heard, uh, many people have said that KEXEC has, yes. there are plenty of potential problems there. Um, so we're we're thinking about it and we're worrying about it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Especially on very complicated hardware, it it makes many problems. So this is my experience. Maybe after many years, something has changed. So one sure. minute left. One question. Last one. Last question. You are first. Considering that case, has there been any thought or consideration to the boot path of instead of? using KEXEC after the boot menu, generating a UKI from the boot, menu, the boot menu environment, and then resetting using boot next to reset into a new UKI that's pre-configured with the options chosen at the boot menu? Huh. Uh, we haven't thought about that, but that's interesting. <laughs> because that, that solves the issue with KEXEC compatibility if you're just resetting the system. Uh -huh. Okay, that's interesting, cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have been discussing something similar in the in the in case of Grab, I think. Okay, uh, so I think time is out. Thank you for your presentation.
Our question is that. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we time is out. Sorry about that. We missed that. Please feel free to get in touch if you yeah. have any questions or any thoughts. Uh, you know. And thank you so much.